Hello everybody, this is John Buck, back with another Continuous Time Linear Systems video. And the subject for today's video is properties of the Laplace transform. We'll see, not surprisingly, after we went through this story with Fourier transforms, Laplace transforms being a more general version of Fourier, that there are properties where we can say, if we shift a signal in time, what happens to the Laplace transform? Or if we convolve two signals in time, what happens, how do we combine their Laplace transforms? What we'll see, not surprisingly, we, we've said the Fourier transform is a special case of Laplace, right? We've said that to get the uh, Fourier transform, I just set S equal to J omega. That is, conceptually, I evaluate the Laplace transform on the imaginary axis, right? And so, not surprisingly, all the properties we know from Fourier will have very similar forms, if not exactly the same forms, in Laplace, because they have to be the same when we set S equal to J omega to the Fourier properties we already know. Okay, so I'm going to uh, switch over to the whiteboard, and we'll start going through some of these. So now, uh, for example, the first one we've seen frequently, if I have Y of T is just a shifted signal in time, pause for a minute and say what you think is going to happen with Laplace. You should be able to guess by now. Right, a shift in time is multiplying by a complex exponential in the other domain. So this will be e to the minus s t naught, the amount of the shift, times x of s. And what if we and what if we have a shift on the Laplace side? So what if we say y of s is x of s minus s naught? We've subtract some s. What do you think is going to happen in the time side? Right, we'll get the same story that shifting in one domain is multiplying by a complex exponential in the other. And so we'll multiply by e to the s naught t. What about if we uh, convolve in time? If I convolve x of t with h of t in time, what do you think will happen in frequency? Remember, Laplace is ultimately a frequency representation. Right, I multiply in frequency. Oh, and I should be saying something about the ROC, right? That if... Uh, when I multiply by this, I have the same ROC. The first property is the same ROC. The second one, if I shift S, I'm also going to shift the ROC by S naught. Let me move over a little bit here. The bottom one, we're going to actually have the new ROC is, includes the intersection of the first two ROCs. So I take the ROC of X, intersect or overlap it with the ROC of H, and figure out what's the smallest ROC for y that includes that intersection, again, where this upside-down cup shape means intersect. What about uh, another property we've seen a bunch? What happens if I take a derivative in time? Well, taking a derivative in time is, right, multiplying by s in frequency, right? Just as we saw for Fourier, it was multiplying by j omega. Well, we know if we want Laplace, if we want to find Fourier from Laplace, we have to set s equal to j omega. So it needs to be something that gives us the same thing back. Well, with that in mind, what do you think happens if we take the derivative in Laplace with respect to s? And so if I take y of s as the derivative with respect to s of x of s, well, what do you think? If I take a derivative in time, I multiply by s in Laplace. If I take a derivative with s, yeah, essentially I'm going to multiply by t in time, but there's an extra minus sign that shows it. And again, this is just a more general form of what happens when I take, if I take the derivative of omega with a frequency response. Now, one more that, that we have used a lot, too, uh, is, or, or that we will use a lot, is what happens when I take an integral in time. So if y of t is the integral from minus infinity to t of x of tau d tau, well, I sort of say, well, derivatives undo integrals, so it turns out, and again, this is all shown in the textbook, I'm just summarizing them here, that taking the, uh, the integral is like multiplying by 1 over s. So that if I take an integral followed by a derivative, the s's cancel out, I'm back to the original thing. And then one more we'll mention is the, uh, what's sometimes called the initial value and final property value theorems. So the initial value theorem says if x of t equals 0 for t less than 0, the value of x just after time 0, this is called 0 plus, this is a little plus sign, which means the instant, the first positive interest instant just on the positive side of 0, is the limit as s goes to infinity of s times x of s. 
And then there's a similar uh, dual version for the final value theorem, which says, again, if I have a causal signal, so if x of t equals 0 for t less than 0, the limit as t goes to infinity of x of t, that is the final value, the limit, the asymptotic value, is also the involves s times x of s, but it's the limit as s goes to 0 rather than as s goes to infinity. So that's the difference between initial and final values theorem. So if for causal signals, I can use the limiting behavior of the Laplace transform at infinity to tell me what's going to happen for the signal at the start, and the value at 0 to tell me what's going to happen at infinity for the time signal. So that's a quick summary of the, the transforms. They're all derived in, in section 9.5 of the textbook and summarized on the table there. Uh, if in table nine in section nine point five and the common Laplace transforms of nine point six, again much as we saw with the Z transform in discrete time linear systems, part of what makes these so useful is these properties often are the key to finding inverse Laplace transforms or Laplace transforms for signals that we can relate to the ones in the table by multiplying by t or taking derivatives or things like that. So they open the door to being smart and lazy to find. Laplace transforms and inverse Laplace transforms without cranking through difficult integrals if I can figure out how to exploit the properties instead. Okay, so that's all for this time. I'll see you in the next video.